Hi everybody, welcome to another one of my shows. It's not really the Ask Weldon show, uh, but it's uh, it's me talking at the camera. So maybe I'll come up with a name for them eventually, but um, my opinions, basically, what it comes down to. So today I want to talk about information warfare in League of Legends. What with all the uh, hacks that have been happening recently in the Korean boot camp for Worlds 2016, I think it's a it's an interesting topic. So I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning, which is when I first uh, was able to come to the LCS studios in LA for the very first time when I was working with CLG, and kind of got a glimpse of the setup that they had there. And I realized at the time, and I had a conversation at the time also with Chris Ehrenreich, who was their coach, about. Um, kind of the traditions in eSport and how they're they're protecting the teams right now from a lot of abuse because, um, okay, so first of all, cheating is really hard in eSport. Cheating is a lot easier in sport where there's rules that you have to follow, but in eSport, it's really hard for you to break the rules. Like you go into a game and you're like, okay, um, I'm going to break the rule in this game. And then you're like, oh, wait, I can't because it's hard-coded. So I can't like wait till the ref's not looking and then punch the guy in the face um, because... I guess they're on the other side of the stage, so you'd have to walk over and punch them in the face. I don't know. It's a uh, it's a lot harder to cheat and like on the field in esports. It's equally as easy to cheat off the field as in other sports. So like, let's say you're backstage or something, and you want to put I don't know Pepto Bismol or some sort of laxative in somebody's drink. You could probably pull it off just about the same as in a traditional sport. Maybe it has more impact in esport because you can't do that on the field stuff i don't really know but anyway um when i got to the lcs i realized essentially that like the lcs gets by on the honor system and the grapevine system which i think is pretty cool i think that it's really awesome that in esport um while it would be really kind of easy to like bug your opponent's room or like uh, sneak something on stage that somebody in the audience would buzz for like a gank or and and I'm not revealing any big secrets here like all the coaches have joked about stuff like this because they know it's like very possible um, or uh, what are they, some of the other hilarious things that people came up with um, I don't know like trap people in the bathroom and then uh, like beat them up or something <laughs> weird whatever intimidate them um, it would be easy to do, but it would, it, it kind of goes against the honor system. Like people in esport right now are um, really like aligned with fair competition. Um, I think that you know that like when people disconnect online, like a lot of people will, a lot of people like obey the honor code of like not killing them. Some people are just merciless, right? And other people like they don't, they don't kill them. And I think that I honestly think that that would happen in an LCS match. I think that in an LCS match, if somebody like disconnected or AFK'd or something like that, like his, their opponents would not kill them. Um, I don't know about the whole like you know Darshan getting stuck in between three minions and like Huni still killed him. That was kind of like maybe a little bit violation of that honor system there. But then again, uh, it was an intended functioning of, of how the champion works, right? So. Um, can't blame him for that. You can't blame people for like not like not honoring honor and kind of like killing people anyway because the the uh, at the end of the day you have to win. That's just all there is to it. If you don't win, then you don't get paid um, very well. So anyway, there's this honor system plus the grapevine system. Like in esports, it's really hard to keep secrets, and any attempt at cheating in the LCS, in my opinion, whether in Europe or the EU would fail completely because people would talk so much. Like, everything gets shared a lot. Um, you know, Skypes get hacked or shared, like, on a regular basis. And generally, like, people are just, like, super kind of, like, uh, talkative and fair competition-based. And so people are... And then people are obviously also afraid that they would lose their careers. And they're probably right. They would. So there's, there's not a lot of cheating that I know of at all. Um, it, it, as far as I know, there's none. So I'm assuming there's a very low amount of cheating that's happening in at least in the North American LCS and the EU LCS. That's my that's my observation, my opinion. So information warfare, however, is a little bit different. Like 
There's a lot of information warfare about trying to find people's solo queue accounts, trying to hide your solo queue accounts, trying to scrim, you know, with certain teams with certain picks and other teams with other picks, kind of like that. Because the really important thing about information warfare is like the picks, the composition, right? This is everything in League of Legends. I don't think that comms are as interesting, communication recordings. Like, what are people going to hear? They're like, oh, let's do Dragon. Okay, no, don't do Dragon right now. I can't. I de I'm dead. I got picked or something. Okay, like... This isn't groundbreaking information. Um, strategy is like 99% in the execution, not so much the strategy. Like we all know what the best tactics are more or less in, in League of Legends. And if you're watching a game in retrospect, you can be like, oh, they should have done this. They should have done this. They should have done this. Even if you have like a variable grass of strategy, if you have an advanced grass of strategy, it's like pretty clear in the moment. Um, but... Yeah, so then, so then strategy and tactics come down to like actually being able to do it, which is choreography, stuff like that. Not so much related to like leaked communications and tactics, but maybe level ones are a little different. But like what is really important is, is the picks, right? Because that's like uh, you can nowadays win the game in draft and lose the game horribly in the drafting phase. Uh, or guarantee like an incredibly lopsided competition. You know, it'd be like playing chess and you could just start with like your queen and your king, but your opponent doesn't get a queen or a bishop like you could start with a full set and they're like missing a few screws or pieces like that is really lopsided for a game and you can kind of do that in league of legends because there's you know there's power picks and there's unpower picks and it's really cool so picks are like all that what information warfare is about and when teams get pissed it's because their picks are coming out and when teams like feel safe after a hack or something is because they're more worried about image and pr and stuff like that but like the picks are safe um, so I want to talk a little bit about like how, or just kind of like how normal teams function. I think that like there's, there's this wonderful aspect in esport where you can have distance coaching, right? It saves teams a lot of money. So you don't have to like have a house for five players plus five coaches and five analysts all living together. You don't have to fly some analyst from like. I don't know, Seattle to LA to like for the season and live there. Instead, people get to like build their resume and build their experience while they're living in Indiana or while they're living in like Toronto or whatever and working with the team like live over the internet. And I think this is an incredibly brilliant thing because I love the aspect of the internet that it allows people to build businesses and careers and freelance and stuff like that and connect their value with other people. Uh, via distance. I think it's very freeing. And I think it's a, it's cool that like the sport of the new generation is one that is like so mobile. That means that like you can actually live in Jersey and like have a career as a professional like esport analyst or something like that. It's really, really nice. So going along with that, there's this exchange of information, right? Replays, VODs for analysis, um, pick and ban templates and things like that. And this is where um, information warfare goes from kind of like tactical where you're trying to get it from scrimming them or from following their solo queue or like various legal means to like nefarious where you're trying to get it through like holes in their system right and there's a couple platforms that are popular for this Dropbox I assume a lot of people use a lot of teams use Google Drive and then physical transport like for example, there's a lot of walking VODs around our computers, the TSM house, because we do not like to put anything online ever. So like they just go through, you know, USB stick to USB stick. Um, and so physical transport obviously being the most secure of that. Now security, both Dropbox and Drive, which I think are the preferred. But by the way, I saw a lot of comments about people like, oh, it looks like, so, you know, they were putting their scrims on YouTube and then their YouTube got hacked. And, only a brain dead idiot would upload their scrimmages with pics and communications to an online video platform. I like almost sure that no team, no professional team is doing it. And if they are, they should like eat their socks or something. Cause that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But anyway, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure almost everybody's using something secure like Google and drive or uh, Google drive or Dropbox. And both of those have two factor authentication and uh, for a long time on all of my kind of like accounts and things like that, I've been using this, which is called a YubiKey, which came out um, a while ago, actually, as a, as a concept. But essentially, this is a two-factor authentication that is waterproof. 
that never runs out of batteries and is crush proof and cannot be hacked in any way by stealing my phone or losing my phone or like losing my uh, SIM card so that somebody else can hack my phone or like getting my um, program on my phone or just like anything related to do with like anything where it could be duplicated anywhere else except this key. This physical key must be inserted into the computer I am using in order to log into any of my accounts with a password. Um, and this is kind of the system that I recommend a lot for everybody that I talk to because for me it has served me well and because one of my friends who happens to run a proxy service whose mission is to essentially uh, kind of take down, to make firewalling unprofitable, to make it so that like the prospect of China or Iraq, like firewalling off their internet, or sorry, Iran, firewalling off their internet would be like very, very impractical money-wise. And so they just wouldn't do it. Um, and there's a way to kind of get to that level of encryption. And that's kind of his mission. And so he has a lot of people like out for him who... Uh, don't, you know, that he does not want to get hacked ever. And this is the system that he uses. He just wears it around his neck. And it's very hard. You'd have to, you have to physically bug him, essentially, to get uh, into a lot of his accounts, unless the actual service itself gets hacked. But a lot of them, like, still have all the data encrypted. And even the data that is encrypted through, like, these kinds of key systems, which are only possible, I think, right now on Dropbox and Drive, are one of the only places that accept these keys, uh, you need this to actually de-encrypt the data on your account. So that's also another handy um, handy thing that they have. So uh, that being said, like a lot of people with two-factor and with not with YubiKeys because you can't like reset passwords and stuff without YubiKeys. If you lose the YubiKeys, you kind of lose everything. Um, but most hacks... Uh, even through two-factor, okay, are done through social hacking. So it's not like there's a lot of people with, like, silly first passwords out there, and it's not like there's a lot of people um, who are, like, getting their passwords guessed. And um, I don't think that there's even a lot of teams that aren't using two-factor. Like, uh, I go and I... I talk to my friends at Envious or like Phoenix or like uh, some of the other teams, you know, and, and they're like, oh yeah, of course, like, of course we use two-factor. That'd be dumb. Maybe not on their, I don't know, social account or something, but like on the team accounts, it's like people take this really seriously. So you have to be, but the, but the, there's a ton of human error that goes into that, right? Because like, let's say you have a, a professional team and you have a staff of, you know, 40, 50 people that all have email addresses under your staff and like some of them are personal and some of them are are like company based and so there's a lot of like holes in there and they're all mostly human error. And since most hacks are done through social hacking by a group of hackers, what happens is like there's this long assault process until, what the, until they find the weak link and then they social hack them, which you can Google that. I'm sure that there's lots of explanations out there about what it is um, that has nothing to do with password guessing and nothing to do with two-factor authentication can even get through it in fact. Um, and uh, the weakest links in all of these are always the comm systems, like Skype, which is like nearly impossible to two-factor. Like you have to go set up like a certain Microsoft account, and then it's really annoying to two-factor, and you can't put a YubiKey on it, um, or like whatever comms or chat system that people are using. There's a lot of uh, people who will like human error put in an unsecured anonymous link. You know those anonymous links you can do when you share like a Google Drive or a Dropbox folder or something like that, and you're like, oh, nobody will ever find this link. Uh, so it doesn't matter if it's like leads, you know, you need the link to get to the file, but then all of a sudden it's in a comm system, which got hacked. And then all of a sudden you have these like shared files and folders that are like set incorrectly in terms of security settings that people forget to double check or like they're set for convenience sake. And then nobody remembers when the comms get hacked that like all of these links are out there, things like that. So, um, I, there's been tons of hacks, by the way, throughout the years. I think that you guys all remember like almost every single scrim leak that's happened, and they they happen like pretty regularly um, because there's always these human error elements, and because the companies are distributed. So places like Microsoft or whatever, like everybody comes in at 8 a.m. You get everybody around, you have a big security meeting, and then you force people to like all like get the new keys and pick them up at the desk and like blah blah blah. 
now we have live in this amazing world where we have distributed companies, right? Where like, I don't even know where some of the people that I work with in TSM live. I, have, I literally have no clue. Like I've only ever interacted with them online. For all I know, they could live in freaking um, the Bermuda Triangle. And that's both an incredible thing and then very difficult from a management perspective because like, let's say, let's say hypothetically that I uh, ask my staff to like get two-factor and everything. And then how do I know if they do or not? They just say yes or no, or it doesn't happen. Or like there's a ton of staff, right? And I can't just like go around and like check everybody's computer one day. I have to like follow up with everybody and then they have to like say that they did it or that they didn't. And But there's no way to like actually have a briefing about that or actually to check their accounts. You just kind of have to go by the, um, by the honor system, I guess. And a lot of times like uh, it's just a convenience thing. So... Now let's fast forward to Korea. There are inherent problems and advantages and disadvantages to like boot camping in Korea. And one of the things that was really frustrating to me coming here is that our coaches can't spectate. So normally in the US, we have uh, plenty of spectator slots. And so everybody can like watch our games and you know, they can coach. And so they're, they're logged into the client and they're spectating our game and they're in TeamSpeak and like, it's all like pretty secure. Like you can only spectate if you're in the lobby. We only let our coaches in the lobby. We're all good, right? But we can't do that here because we scrum on live and there's only two spectator slots. So all of a sudden, we have to start using outside systems to like get information to our coaches. Whereas the Korean coaches are already here. They have a full staff in the house. And even though they only have two spectator slots, just like us, they're physically standing there with the players and they can have as many coaches as they want. So I'm limited to me, one spectator in, you know, in the uh, training room, and then one spectator in the U.S., even though we have like a large staff. And how do I get like my VODs to my analysts and, and stuff like that who can like normally like uh, normally maybe spectate a scrim, but now all of a sudden like we have to transport a lot more information online than we did before and the korean teams of course are here and all of that stuff happens in-house so they don't have to worry about digital transport so that's kind of like a very dangerous situation in the u.s as well we'll be scrimming on the tournament realm so korean coaches will be able to spectate from korea live like here when they're here and listen to like secure i i think so i think they'll be able to connect to the tournament realm in the u.s from here i'm actually not sure we should double check on that Seems like it'd be really secure to do that, so we should recommend that they do that. But I don't know, um, and they'll and they'll listen to like probably secure Teamspeak servers or secure audio servers, right? So they won't have to transfer anything via Dropbox or via Drive or via whatever system that they want. Like they'll have it all there, and so I think it's a really crappy situation for visiting teams because it's really hard. Uh, you either have to take a performance hit and like not use your staff at like one of the most crucial competitive moments of the year to like get as much data done as possible. Or you have to risk. You have to risk like, oh, well, maybe one of my analysts from some other country like happened to not secure his account. Or maybe this one analyst that like I've only worked with three times and then he retired and like went to another thing and he still had access to this one folder that like or something like there's just all this stuff that like uh, is kind of random. It can really screw you over here and there. And... Um, Luckily, I think that our, I'm not really sure. Um, luckily, I think that like our trip to Korea is not maybe the main reason that we got hacked uh, or that C9, it appears, got hacked. Um, but yeah, it definitely like exposed a frustrating kind of situation around the transport of information and how reliant we are on these secondary systems that are kind of like outside the game to get files here and there. And uh, yeah, I recommend, as always, that everybody gets one of these and uses it. And you can actually only secure really like Google, Dropbox, uh, Google Drive and Dropbox with these, but you can, um, you can get something like LastPass, like a password manager, which usually I don't really recommend all that much because those can be hacked as well. And if you're a hacker, um, which I'm, I'm hoping none of you are, but if you're a hacker and you're thinking like, what do I hack in the world? What should I target? 
The number one thing you ever want to target is password managers. Like every single hacker in the entire universe is constantly assaulting every single password manager, uh, like at the speed of light. I promise. Like there, that's the number one thing that everybody wants to hack, uh, because it's like the holy grail, right? You get you if you can hack a password manager, you get everything. Um, if you can crack their authentication, or if you can like crack their servers and figure out how they authenticate. But with LastPass which is a nice one. I'm not recommending this or anything, but it's just one that I found. There are other ones that also enable this. You can use a YubiKey, which means that you can like encrypt and uh, you can encrypt the data that they have of your passwords on their cloud, and only this can unencrypt un it. So even if they hack LastPass's servers, they still just have a pile of encrypted data, and that encrypted data needs this to unencrypt. So it's like as about as secure as you can get there. So yeah, information more friendly League of Legends, it's, uh, it's starting to be a big thing. And I do wonder, like, on the scrims that we see on YouTube and people are like, hey, I'm going to sell a bunch more information, I really wonder, like, how many teams are taking them up on that offer. As, I mean, I can't really know, right? But if I were a coach looking for scrimmage information, I would be like, hmm, this guy's selling me scrims. And then I wouldn't do it because... My mantra has always been, always been about execution. Execution is the game. Like, information is good. Information is, like, nice to have. But the number one driving factor of success is can you execute or not? And in our group stages, we should be good enough, first of all, just to straight up get out of group stages, whether or not they know our picks or not. And in other matches, it's possible for you to adapt, like in a best of five, right? So either you're good enough to pull it off or you're not. They have three bands and five picks. Um, and we're just going to try to be better at League of Legends than anybody who would practice information warfare against us. That's the basic idea. And I do think that a lot of the information warfare that is like being publicized, so when a hacker like puts out a big thing like this, it is really like animosity that drives it because they really screw over the teams that they're exposing like super hard. And so, like, I would say that it has to be, like, a European uh, or Chinese hacker at this point because they're just releasing North American and Korean scrims, essentially. And that could not be the case because maybe they're going to release a lot more. Who knows? But, um, but, yeah, it just feels bad that there's people out there that, like, actually hate other regions so much that they really want to screw them over like that or that actually hate certain teams or that just like hate league of legends so much that they want to like mess with the system so yeah luckily and very luckily but not surprisingly none of this warfare that comes from within league itself like teams are not attacking other teams with information warfare which is which is delightful because it's so different in traditional sport where there's, I think, a much like a much more a much lower level of like kind of justice sometimes or morality in terms of like victory and winning. And league in particular. Now, I don't think that this is true of other esports because I think that there's a lot more rampant chemical usage in other esports outside of League of Legends. I've seen like almost I've seen absolutely zero usage of like performance enhancing drugs uh that are on the like ban lists in league of legends people don't even don't even think about i mean heck my players don't even like taking fish oil when i give it to them they're like what i don't want to put a pill in my mouth um that's how like pure they are you know and it's beautiful to see because i think that this esport in particular is very like honor driven at the professional level and it's just a, like everybody feels bad when either we get hacked or an opponent gets hacked and that stuff gets out there because it feels like it just makes the competition less fair somehow. And it's lame that like the fans of the sport itself are the ones that are doing it and like screwing over people who are like kind of living their lives in a very like like noble way in terms of their own conduct. So yeah, those are some of my thoughts about Information Warfare and League of Legends. And no real, I can't really tell you any details about the situation. I'm not going to go into that. I'm not going to go into anything about like C9 or TSM's hacks. Like that's kind of up to 
the org, like how much we're going to share about that, like a group decision. But um, these are these are things that I've been noticing like throughout the years that I've been working in League of Legends that I just want to kind of want to share and maybe spur some discussion in the community about uh, what it means to be uh, honorable in in League. And next time somebody disconnects in your lane, don't kill them. Try it. See what it feels like. So yeah, thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in, and as always, this is my show, and it's sponsored by me, and you can check out my stuff over here, it's been spinning on the side, I have a reading list, which um, you can sign up for right now, but I'm still editing it up, so you might not get an email right away, but I'm going to start sending out like reviews of my like three main books, and then I'm going to add on to it as well, um, so you can sign up for it now, and like you're not going to get the first email right away, so don't like wait with bated breath, but I'm working on it. Um, then there's the... 5-Minute Journal, which is a tool that I use with pro teams a lot. Um, every single team that I've worked with, I've used it in some form or another. Usually I, I may have them make their own journal, but there is a product. This is the one that I used first in my own life and then I bought for my friends and handed out and was like, this is amazing. And there's a link down below that you can go and purchase that if you want. And then there's the Mac program, which is my flagship training product, which I created starting in 2013. And this is in its third iteration. And it's like basically... It's like a login, right? It's a it's a 47 video series training program. Uh, each single day is like a little bit of mindfulness combined with a little bit of lecture. And it goes through three topics, mindfulness, acceptance, and commitment. And it's the same kind of training that I do with the, with the pro teams that I work with and with the amateurs that I work with and that I put myself through. And it's based on a 2004 like kind of movement in sports psychology that came from education, where in the education world in the 90s, there was this guy named Kabat Zin. Kabat, I forget what his name was. Anyway, um, and he really pioneered the idea of like mindfulness-based uh, therapies in educational psychology for children and for like educational disorders. And that movement kind of went into sport starting around 2004. That's when the research movement started. And it really has picked up steam in the last 12 years. And now it's like shown to be much more efficacious, like powerful in terms of the effect that it can have on performance compared to things like imagery or goal setting or self-talk or some of these kind of more traditional psychological interventions that, that normally like mental trainers will do. And yeah, so I've been developing this program kind of over the years, trying to like find a way to deliver it online to the masses and iterating upon it started as like a once a week kind of one and a half hour video. Then it went to like, you know, f kind of like chunked into four like thematic ones. And then I realized it needed a daily kind of a, uh, kind of rhythm to it. And it also needed its own mindfulness component, not just talking about it and expecting you to do it by yourself. But now I actually lead you through the guided meditations that go along with the kind of learning process. So yeah, check it out if you want. It's a little bit cheap right now because... I'm jumping over to a new site because my old one is like gone and I lost a couple of the worksheets that go with the program, which are not as important as the actual practice of mindfulness. And I'll be adding them in kind of like as I go. And at that point, the price will go up, but it's lifetime membership. You buy it once you're done and you always get access and it will always live there on mindgames.gg and kind of like as it improves, you always get upgraded to the newest version. So check it out and I appreciate the attention. I'll see you guys next time.